this really started from the grounds that um, people have been talking about how UK used to have an electronics industry and we lost it. And we used to have a design industry and we lost that as well. Uh, and it's really um, a load of bull because we were all working in it and we all knew people all around us who were working in it and were being successful. So I think the only thing that had really changed, at least this was our initial view, was the thing that had really changed was the, uh, the nature of, if you like, electronic products. Uh, and so <coughs> the industry would have changed shape as a result of that. Now, not surprisingly, if we think back only a relatively few years, um, the, the size of an electronic system that you carried around with you in any way, shape or form was next to zero because it was the level of integration that it was possible for you to have only allowed you to do something like a pocket calculator. So the world has moved on a lot. So we mustn't expect that the world that we're measuring today is going to be the same as the world that we were measuring in the past. And this is, this is if you like, the background of this activity. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing that we had to do was to spend a bit of time looking at this concept that we, that we coined called electronic systems. What are electronic systems? And the, the first thing is that they are fundamental to, to so many products in today's, today's world that it's hard to say that they are electronic as such. They are integrations of technology. They, are, they provide a system level functionality. But they are the things which are increasingly enabling our lives, but a lot more um, than our personal lives. They're also enabling um, our society because so many of the things that we depend on socially are dependent on electronic systems working. Now, electronics are in there. Embedded software is in there. Tie into mechanical, optical. Uh, all of these things, these are products which are delivering something which is, which is needed by society. And if you look then at the, uh, the components that, that are inside it, I've got electronics, software, mechanical, optical, transducers, analog, etc., etc. It also, though, extends not just in the technologies, but from the entire uh, front to back life cycle research, design, reproduction, automation, qualification, etc., uh, maintenance of the life cycle activities. And this, so it effectively is a, a two dimensional matrix, it's probably a three dimensional matrix. Um, our society's dependence on electronic systems is also a strategic vulnerability, and this is one of the big things that we identified in ESCO. Um, as a society, if you take electronic systems out of it right now, then we are in a, a very serious position because so much of what we depend on, literally depend on what we live, depends on the existence of electronic systems. We had better, as a nation, have a, a, a stake in this thing because otherwise we're going to become totally dependent on other people to supply the electronic systems that our economy needs and that is definitely not uh, an, uh, to be encouraged environment. <coughs> so who are this electronic systems community? <coughs> well essentially they're all of the activities involved in the UK who feed into the life cycle of electronic systems. And it's important to realize that electronic systems are not things of any particular nation or of any specific geography. This is the old factory model of having a, a large building with a smoking chimney stack and people coming in in their myriads on their bikes, Lowry-like. Uh, that's the old world. In the 21st century global world, people who are making electronic systems are building them and creating them all around the world and they're using technology and knowledge and know-how from all around the world to do that and the UK is a part of that world no more no less we are in a good educational position and we are we have leaders in some areas in these electronic systems and the electronic systems are not necessarily directly tied to specific markets at the level where many of these people are, are participating. That's not to say that all of them are not, it's just that most of them are not. Most of the people involved in doing this are now contributing knowledge, methods, quality, reliability, education, components, physical and virtual, 
subsystems, physical and virtual, into the electronic systems which are being produced around the world, some of which are feeding back into the UK and helping to, to support our society in a personal and, uh, and professional means. So what's, what we know then is the UK, just by observation, is quite active in this area. The problem we had is how on earth do we define this area, how do we count it? And so that was the challenge that, uh, that I undertook with, uh, with some assistance uh, within the ESCO phase one. So quantifying the invisible because this community has become invisible. Once upon a time it was a big factory, you could actually drive your politician up to the front door and they could have a tour around and they could see things being soldered onto printed circuit boards and they knew because of the scale of the, uh, uh, of, of the people coming in and out of the building how important it was. We have moved on from that, uh, we know that, and, the, and, and what we have created on the other hand is incredibly technically sophisticated but invisible because most people who don't have a technical background are not really able to understand many of the things that, uh, that now goes on in this area. So we had the process of trying to quantify the invisible. I'm going to rush through this. Uh, the information is in the report. You can look at it in glorious detail. We've not been secretive about this at all. The idea was to be open. The idea was to, uh, to make it repeatable so that we can monitor ourselves, but to anybody who has any criticism of it uh, can see how it was done and they can, uh, they can convince themselves or come and convince us that we've done it wrong. They're always open to, to suggestions. The good news is there hasn't been too many negative criticism about it so far. Um, the other thing, so we had uh, access to what was called the FAME commercial database of UK registered companies and we com collated that information with the assistance of BIS uh, for, with information from HM Revenue and Customs. And that's a very interesting uh, thing to be able to do to start with because we're able to identify the companies in the UK and the people in the UK that actually declare themselves working for those companies in the UK. So shell companies disappear in this model of the world. You find out who is actually working in these companies. Uh, we quantified this uh, using uh, the income approach, one of the three approaches which is recognized in basic e economics. Uh, so it's the production and the expenditure approaches are the other two. Production approach is the one that HM ta Tax and Revenue tends to use and tends to be the one, therefore, that the accountants focus on. But the income approach is more directly mappable to employment. So the income approach basically says um, we can look at an individual and his or her contribution to the economy and you can count it. You can count the individuals that now work in the UK in electronic system domain. You can sum up their, their uh, salaries because we've got the information from HR, HM Tax and Revenue and, they, uh, uh, and therefore you can work out what their economic contribution is. You don't need a factory. You don't need a uh, a, 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 a readily identi identifiable added value which the other uh, approaches tend to, to give you which also means then as a result that rather difficult things to pin down like companies which are based on knowledge or uh, enterprises like universities who are doing research uh, which have always been rather difficult to justify in, in the sense of their economic contribution you can now quantify them because it's the size of the departments involved, it's also the, the total wage packets that go along with them. It also enables you to quantify the electronic systems activities which are embedded in things like Tesco's uh, or in the uh, armed services or in defense and security, all of those kind of activities. Um, companies which, are, um, which are, have a badge which represents a uh, societal object like um, travel, uh, and yet inside them may very well have electronic systems activities which again are contributing to the UK economy and are part of this community that we're talking about. Uh, as I said, the, the information and the, the methods are available in the, on the ESCO website um, and the thing about this is we believe the numbers. And I think it's an important thing to say here. We believe the numbers and so does BIS and so does an increasingly European Commission audience. These, these figures and the methods have been uh, looked at. Now I've had quite a few um, uh, approaches over the, 
well, now two years since it's, uh, since it's been uh, pre-released, pre but since the numbers have been finalized, by people who wanted to understand more detail how these things have, have been calculated and how they work. And generally speaking, they've only come back with good feedback on it. So the, as time progresses, the confidence in the numbers gets better. So what are the numbers then? Well, the main thing is that there are two classes of employment. And this is class one, which is those who are involved directly in electronic system enterprises. So these are enterprises whose badge above the door basically defines them as an electronic systems company. Um, there are 30,000 of these in the UK and they employ around 400,000 people, 435,000 is what it says. Don't get too hung up on the precision of the data. There are things that you can pick out of that. 50% of the employment in this sector is in the 250 companies whose average size is 1,180. Now it's interesting to note there, there are 250 companies who are <coughs> on average one and a half thousand or one and a bit thousand people big and they are overtly electronic systems companies. So these are, these are not companies which are, which are doing something else. These are companies who, who principally have that title above their door. It also shows that 80% of the enterprises are less than 10, 10 employees, which is this relatively large community of SMEs. These represent a huge growth opportunity, and it was reflecting the comment that was made across the room. Bigger companies inevitably evolve, whereas small companies have the opportunity to be revolutionary. And in fact, they're driven to a situation of revolutionary because they, they have to survive on a day-by-day -day basis. So radical change is likely to emerge from small companies, whereas evolutionary change is likely to emerge from larger ones. <coughs> the second group, then, are the embedded electronic systems activities. So these are electronic systems within other businesses. So these are businesses which have something else, some other badge above their door, the Tesco's, the travel agents, the aerospace, um, and so on, which are, which are overtly there to, to, to deliver something which is not obviously, obviously an electronic system, but nevertheless depends on them. Um, of this we find there are another broadly the same 420,000 uh, UK employees and these again for emphasis point these are people employed in the UK by these companies so it's not if we if we identify a, an international operation such as ST Microelectronics we're, we're counting the number of people who are employed by ST Microelectronics in the UK two and a half million um, enterprises <laughs> in the UK there are 400, roughly 400,000 of them are uh, uh, enterprises which employ electronic systems people. Again, 40% of the employment is in the 250 plus companies, but you have to look at the, the size of those companies. Those are companies which are now not electronic systems companies. They are known primarily as something else, so their electronic systems activities are smaller than the, uh, uh, the total headcount. Um, interesting to note that there are still two, two million businesses in the UK today that have no electronic systems roles inside them, which is a huge opportunity for increasing the, the uh, uh, productivity of those businesses and therefore is a huge opportunity for the electronic systems, overtly electronic systems businesses in the UK to help the, the other community. So what it looks like as, a, as a, an overall uh, we're talking then 855, 856,000 employees, which is 3% of the UK working population, contributing 78.3 billion pounds per annum to the G UK GDP. And this is UK GDP, it's not gross added value or anything else like this. This is a direct figure related to the UK GDP. And, uh, and it's not the size of a big company, uh, the international part of a big company, and we're not talking about a shell company which has got a, ha a large revenue, but most of the uh, uh, of the cash actually flows directly out of the company, this out of the country. This is the UK footprint contribution, and it's 5.3 percent of the um, UK GDP from the UK from the UK electronic systems sector. 
It's far bigger and more successful than its monolithic electronic predecessors. And I want you to think about that because if the if the examples that we were thinking of as as examples of failure were were GEC who collapsed and at the time it employed 30,000 people in the UK. We're now talking about 800,000 people employed in this sector in the UK. Yes, it's moved on. This is the electronic systems sector, whereas GEC was probably uh, was rather diverse and its electronics was significantly less than its, uh, than its headcount at the time. Um, and it's also a highly productive sector. 5.4% of UK GDP from 3% of the working population. We're a, a well-paid sector in general and we spend money, so this is good news. Now, I can't finish this without men mentioning ESCO, and the reason I stuck with a different slide form on this uh, was that the electronic systems community is not ESCO. ESCO is simply a focus for the electronic systems company. Uh, the first activity of, uh, of ESCO was to, to quantify this and to, and, and to summarize the opportunity that it represented. But ESCO did not create the, electronic, the UK electronic systems community and it doesn't own it. We are still here. We're still there. What we're talking about is using ESCO to be our focal point, to be our mouthpiece, to be our guide, to be our ears, and also to help us to do things which are in our best interests. So ESCO does have the opportunity to, uh, to influence us in a positive direction, but it also has a, an opportunity to represent us, to never let us be invisible again, because we have been invisible once. And it's important to realize that it's electronic systems, not electronics, and it's, ele and it's not software, and it's not IT or ICT, it's electronic systems. And it includes aspects of all of those things, but we have to recognize that systems are what's driving technology today and systems are the way that technologies work together to deliver human level functionality. So conclusions then. The 20th century market for electronics has evolved into the insatiable 21st century market for electronic systems. Electronic systems have moved into the commodity market in a way that electronics never did. Electronics back in GEC's heyday was a professional market only. Nowadays it's a consumer market. Uh, the pro these products are too complex to be created and supported by any company, single company or country. They are the children of global enterprise and the UK is in there. Involved in uh, offers their, offering their products lucratively into the global market. Lucratively. It's very important to realize these things. These people supplying into the global market are competing globally with other people who are offering similar products. The way that our UK electronic systems companies succeed in their role in the global electronic systems businesses is by being competitive. And they are competitive. Some older monoliths didn't make this transition. This is called evolution. Some failed, and it's the, the, the ones that died that actually created the ones that succeeded. So the roles of these UK electronic enterprises is overtly technical. We mustn't forget that. As they become more specialized, they become more difficult to be understood by people who are not scientifically qualified. They are difficult to be understood, some of the roles are difficult to be understood by people who are technically qualified. So let's just not get this out of perspective. It's very difficult. Some of the stuff that these people are doing is very, very specialized, but the value is that speciality. <coughs> and if I haven't already said it enough, the UK's valued presence in electronic systems is strategically important to the nation. We mustn't underestimate that. So 850,000 people, 5.4% to UK GDP, biggest sector, it's one of the biggest sectors in the UK. Only tourism is identifiably bigger than it at 9%. There's a few which are of the same scale, but it's actually difficult to translate their numbers, which are not quoted in GDP. But in, quoted in other contexts, uh, but tourism is clearly bigger than it. But we're right up there. This is a community which is a significant community. 5.4% from 3% of the workforce. Productivity 
Um, the way governments, the way economists like to talk about it, they talk about productivity. We have one understanding about productivity, which tends to be how, how efficiently we stick components into printed circuit boards or the equivalent of. Productivity from, uh, from the economics point of view is how efficiently people convert, uh, they contribute to the GDP. And a, and a productive industry is one like that, where 3% of the workforce produces twice its share of GDP. And that is good by anybody's calculation. Uh, uh, so this sector is one of the greatest development opportunities in the UK. And it's a story of success. And I hate it when people make comparisons with other countries about how successful they are, because we should be looking very much at how successful we are, because I think we're leading this in this area. And I think that's my last comment. Thank you. I'll quite happily take any comments or questions. Comments, please. Right. Well, the main thing is the reports, the full report, uh, which is aimed at being quite readable, is avail available on the ESCO website. Uh, and also the spreadsheet, which is not aimed at being terribly easily readable, but anybody who wants to sort of delve into the, the maths, and the, it's not complex maths, but it is actually uh, uh, quite elaborate. Um, and anybody who wants any further information from myself uh, in terms of background or reference, I'm quite happy to talk about it with them.